Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, I'm Joseph Pierce, and welcome to this episode of The Authority, where this time, actually, we are going to break the mold, so to speak, because uh, all of the others uh, episodes thus far, um, and I think henceforth, at least for the time being, are going to be about individual authors. Um, this 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 particular episode, however, we are devoting to three separate authors, the Bronte sisters, um, so Emily, Charlotte, and Anne, um, and so um, we'll be looking at their their works, the three sisters. But we'll be, let's begin with the the mother and father. Their mother died when they were very young. So they were never really knew their mother. Uh, their father was the Reverend Patrick Bronte, and this is this is significant. Um, when they were young, when the when, when when the sisters were young, the the Brontes moved to Howarth, which is a small town on the edge of the Yorkshire Dales. Um, beautiful town if you ever get a chance to go there. A natural fact, if you do get a chance to go there, there's a wonderful walk you can do from Howarth Parsonage, which is where they lived and which has now become a museum to the Brontes. You can walk from there across the moors to the ruined farmhouse, which is alleged to have been the model for Wuthering Heights. And then you can walk from Wuthering Heights, that ruined farmhouse, to the larger house that's alleged to have been the inspiration for Thrushcross Grange. In the novel *Wuthering Heights*, and then you can walk, make that make the whole thing a circle, and come back to Howard Parsonage again. You get a feel of walking across the moors. You can really get a feel of being in the novel. You want to feel in situ. That's a way to do it. But the Reverend Patrick Bronte served uh, as a as a good, uh, loyal, and devout uh, Anglican vicar, Anglican parson um, to the people of Howarth in Yorkshire for forty years. So the, the Brontes were raised in a, a good, solid, devout Anglican uh, family. So their Christianity is not in doubt, in spite of the efforts of many modern, postmodern, uh, ideology-driven uh, critics and historians to, to say otherwise. I've I spent quite a lot of time writing about this. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it today. You can take my word for it, or you can check out what I have written about about it, especially at Wuthering Heights, um, I wrote the introduction to the Ignatius Critical Edition of Wuthering Heights, and, I, and th in that I go into into the nonsense spoken about the Bronte sisters in general and Emily in particular at some length. So if you want to dig deeper, that's how you can do it. But this will not be the topic of our conversation today. We're going to be more not we're not going to spend time with such nonsense, rebutting such nonsense. So. What we see that the, the, the Brontes are, I would say, as Christian as Jane Austen, who was the author that was the focus of the previous episode. Um, but they are, are more uh, romantic in, shall we say, questionable, even bad sense of the word. They are somewhat delirious. Uh, they they really do allow uh, passions to, I, I, say, I don't get the better of them. I'm not sure if that's true as we shall see but they do allow that that passion its head that's for sure um they create monstrous characters who uh, fling themselves about um following their heart heedlessly and headlessly um but then the key thing here is that the christian morality prevails and usually this this headless heedless passion is is exhibited in a manner to show its destructive qualities. So they they do allow passion its head, but only to show the danger and destructiveness and self destructiveness of so doing. So in that sense, we should see a, a, a novel such as Wuthering Heights in the same way in which we should see a play such as Romeo and Juliet. That what Shakespeare does in Romeo and Juliet is to show the destructiveness and self destructiveness of uh, of allowing. Uh, our passions to rule uh, our reason. 
in, in, in the sense of the older generation, the Capulets and the Montagues, they allow their passion of of hatred towards uh, towards the other family to 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 distort and pervert their understanding of things. In the case of uh, the young lovers, uh, well, one's very young, Juliet, who's Shakespeare makes only thirteen years old. It's the age of his daughter when he was writing it, um, uh, and and Romeo that they, that we f- we find that they're, they're heedless, headless, idolatry and idolatrous relationship. Literally, that they the 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 the, the so called love of the other uh, becomes a quasi religion, which which exorcises the divine from their lives, and it and it and it and it results in self destruction. Wuthering Heights needs to be the same, seen the same way that we need to see Heathcliff and Cathy. In Wuthering Heights, in the same way we see Romeo and Juliet, if we're seeing the play as Shakespeare wrote it, and if we're seeing the novel as Emily Bronte wrote it, both of whom, of course, profoundly uh, devout Christians. And how do we find the Christian presence in uh, Wuthering Heights? We find it primarily in the voice of Nellie Dean, and she um, uh, is the uh, narrator for, for most of the novel. So the novel opens with Mr. Lockwood being the narrator. But then Mr. Lockwood hands the center stage, you like, to, to Nellie Dean. Nellie Dean tells Mr. Lockwood the story. And then, it, then it's in her voice. And it stays in her voice right until near the end of the novel. So she's the narrator. And up to a point, we see the novel through her eyes, through her perspective. And she's a very devout, and I would even say holy Christian voice and a, and a holy Christian presence. She's not the least bit taken in by, 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 the, um, by the, the wild, mad, passionate uh, relationship that, that Heathcliff uh, and Cathy have for each other, which is destructive of both of them and of everybody that comes into contact with them. So I'm going to just say a few words about Nellie Dean because I think understanding her is the key to understanding Wuthering Heights. It is she who attempts to bring the plot's protagonist to their senses. She warns Heathcliff that, quote, proud people breed sad sorrows for themselves. That, by the way, could be a motto for the whole novel. These words of wisdom... um, uh, <laughs> just say the same thing again. <laughs> These words of wisdom will serve as the very defining moral and motto of the novel. The whole story is the weaving of the sad sorrows brought upon the main protagonists by their own pride. The wisdom of Nettie's words and the suspicion that they are the words of the author speaking vicariously are present in an exchange with Catherine in which Nellie emerges as an incisive Christian theologian. If I were in heaven, Catherine says, I should be extremely miserable. The reason, says Nellie, is because, quote, all sinners would be miserable in heaven. Her axiomatic riposte should be borne in mind as the dialogue continues, particularly in the light or darkness of Catherine's obsession with Heathcliff. So these are Catherine's words. My great miseries in this world have been Heathcliff's miseries, and I watched and felt each from the beginning. My great thought in living is himself. If all perished and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained and he were annihilated, the universe would turn to a mighty stranger. I should not seem a part of it. My love for Heathcliff resembles the eternal rocks, a source of little visible delight, but necessary. Nelly, I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind. Not as a pleasure, any more than I'm always a pleasure to myself, but say my own being. So don't talk of our separation again. These are not the words of devotion in any, in any healthy sense. They're the words of demonic possession, quite frankly. In this well-known passage, Catherine is confessing the infernal nature of her love for Heathcliff, who is not merely her idol, but her demonic god. She not only worships him, she is possessed by him. This demonic dimension was not lost on G.K. Chesterton, who wrote that Heathcliff, quote, fails as a man as catastrophically as he succeeds as a demon. 
The demonic is further suggested by the fact that Catherine's words, I am Heathcliff, echo those of Milton Satan, myself am hell. Like Satan, she is exiled from heaven because everywhere, even heaven, would be a mighty stranger to her if Heathcliff were not there. She would not seem a part of it. She would rather be with him in hell than without him in heaven. Nothing will separate her from the love of her God, not even the love of God. She will be with Heathcliff forever, not merely till death do us part, but beyond death itself. Heathcliff is the eternal rock upon which she builds her church. He is a source of little visible delight, but on the contrary is darkness visible like Milton's Satan and the source of all her suffering. Yet she will not be separated from the hell she has chosen. She, get, she gets what she chooses. This is profoundly orthodox Christian theology in the finest tradition of Dante's Inferno and indeed for lovers of C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. The towering influence of Dante is once more evident in the scene between Heathcliff and Catherine when the latter is on her deathbed. Catherine's love for Heathcliff is so disordered that it seems indistinguishable from hate. I shall not pity you, not I, she says. You have killed me and thriven on it, I think. The moment of death for Heathcliff and for Catherine is not a time for reconciliation, either with God or with each other. It is a time for bitter reproach, a time for venting one's spleen in one final act of self-destructive abandonment. I wish I could hold you till we were both dead, Catherine exclaims. I shouldn't care what you suffered. I care nothing for your sufferings. Why shouldn't you suffer? I do. Catherine still has no desire for heaven, preferring the hell of Heathcliff. She makes her choice and is self-condemned by it. Heathcliff, for his part, spits his venom at Catherine, but would prefer to writhe with her in the inferno in an eternal love-hate embrace than live without her in heaven or on earth. This is a quote from Heathcliff. Are you possessed with the devil to talk in that manner to me when you are dying? Do you reflect that all those words will be branded in my mem memory and eating deeper eternally after you have left me? It is not sufficient for your infernal selfishness that while you are at peace, I shall writhe in the torments of hell. I shall not be at peace, moaned Catherine. With the voice of Nellie Dean in mind and with the self-destructive, possessed, demoniacal love of Heathcliff and Cathy, you would think that the Christian morality of the novel is off obvious enough, but it won't stop. As, as Chesterton said uh, of his own novels, it doesn't matter how much I make the point of a story stick out like a spike, the critics will go and carefully impale themselves on something else. Or well, the critics have empowered themselves on anything else but the obvious Christian uh, um, morality of, of Wuthering Heights. And one thing they cling on to and, and, and impale themselves upon is the character of Joseph. Now, Joseph um, is, uh, so he says, a uh, Christian. Uh, he's a Calvinist Puritan. Um, and we have to understand that, that the, the Bronte sisters were brought up as the daughters of a pious Anglican parson, um, and the Anglicanism, um, uh, in certainly in, in in yes, Anglicanism basically is not Calvinistic except for the lowest part, lowest church parts of it, and uh, and and the Reverend Patrick Bronte was not of that 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 persuasion. So there's this divide in Anglican Christianity between what we might call the High Church or even the Anglo-Catholic wing. Uh, which which basically uh, embraces uh, free will, and then and then the, the most the low church part of the Anglican Church uh, accepts Calvinistic predestination. What we actually see in the novel, if anything, uh, is Emily Bronte's dis dislike for and disdain of 
uh, this sort of puritanical Calvinism. Joseph, um, the character, lacks charity. Um, he he's judgmental. Uh, he he's not happy even at the end of the novel when it, when 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 the d- demonic has been exorcised. He thinks singing is a sin. Uh, and uh, Nettie Dean reproaches him at the end of the novel to read his Bible like a Christian. Uh, in other words, to just to, to learn what the Bible actually says and, and beginning with charity, living with charity, which Joseph lacks. So if anything, this is this is Emily Bronte's giving her doctrinal position uh, as, as, a, as a, an Anglican, a high church Anglican, as, as distinct from from this judgmental, uh, non-charitable puritanism of Joseph. The overarching moral of, 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 of Wuthering Heights, however, is that cruelty breeds cruelty. The abused become abusers. One of the saddest realities of life is you would think that if someone suffered abuse uh, as, as a child, for instance, whether it be physical abuse or sexual abuse, they would, they, they would um, be the least likely to become abusers themselves. But sadly, that's not the case, that the, in, being, in being abused, uh, they are they become uh, abuse victims and actually abusers themselves. Now that's really what uh, is happening in in um, uh, Wuthering Heights is that the cruelty of one generation plays itself out in the cruelty of the next generation, the abuse becoming abusers. But what what's the overarching moral behind that is that if we won't have virtue, we would have nothing but viciousness. There's no middle path. There's no relativistic understanding of things. If we refuse sanctity, we will have the inferno. That ultimately sanctity and sanity are the same things. And if you want to live in a sane, healthy society, we have to have holiness. Um, So the choice is between virtue or viciousness. uh, And there's no middle path. We won't have virtue. We will have nothing but viciousness. That's what's shown in the novel. Although we should say, without necessarily spoiling it, it doesn't end that way. It has a um, a happy ending. And perhaps perhaps we'll end on the happy ending before we move on to to Charlotte Bronte's novel Jane Eyre. So Wuthering Heights end on a, ends on a light note in both senses of the word. Following Heathcliff's death. The darkness lifts and the emergent light lightens the burden of evil that has loomed doom-laden over the whole work. As Mr. Lockwood returns to Wuthering Heights, we are almost dazzled by light and lifted by light-heartedness. Love, true love, is in the air, not its infernal inversion. This happy ending serves as the final judgment on the novel itself, confirming that Emily Bronte, like the indomitable Nellie Dean, is on the side of the angels. Let's now move on to Jane Eyre. Um, and um, Jane Eyre is, uh, is what um, has become known in the literary circles as a Bildungsroman, uh, a, a rite of passage where we follow one character uh, in her uh first-person uh, narrative, so she, she's telling the story of her, should we say, uh, progress through life, which is also a pilgrim's progress or a spiritual progress. It's very different, this first-person narrative by the protagonist from the approach of Emily Bronte, where the the the, 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 the narrate narrative voice is Mr. Lockwood, and then uh, within the Mr. Lockwood's narrative is frames Nellie Dean's narrative. So we hear about uh, the, 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 the principal characters, uh, such as uh, Heathcliff and, and, and Kathy, uh, in, through the voices of, of others, the first person observers of others. Well, uh, uh, but in Jane Eyre, we actually have Jane Eyre speaking to us directly of what she goes through. And she goes through a lot. So she has a very unhappy and abusive childhood. Um, uh, uh, and then when she go- goes away to school, her school days, she has makes friendships and some of them very valuable friendships, but she also suffers abuse and unhappiness at school. But she meets someone uh, and, and you know, we have uh, 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 Nellie, Nellie Dean or Ellen Dean and we have a Helen Burns uh, as, as, as the sort of uh, the voice of sanity and sanctity in, 
in Jane Eyre, she doesn't have a major role. Well, she has a major role. She doesn't have a long-standing role. She only appears in part of the novel. But she's very holy. She dies young. She actually dies in Jane's arms. But but prior to that death and, and at that death, we see her acceptance of suffering. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a key ingredient, a uh, key component. In fact, um, um, uh, it's the crux uh, the very cross, if you like, on which on which life hangs, that we 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 cannot avoid suffering. Suffering is going to happen to all of us. It's what we do with it when it happens is what matters. And uh, there's a character in a novel by Morris Baring, who perhaps will be a subject of a, of a, a future uh, episode of The Authority, a great uh, convert. Catholic novelist from between the two world wars, great friend of G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc, and, 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 and a great novelist. But in one of the characters, is a priest character in his novel Darby and Joan, uh, which is his final novel, um, that said uh, that the acceptance of suffering, I'm sorry, the acceptance of sorrow uh, is the meaning of life. When you understand that, you will understand everything. So the acceptance of sorrow, the acceptance of suffering being the meaning of life. I would go deeper and say that, that we all, that, that we, when we receive suffering, we either accept it or we reject it. And we can't reject the suffering in the sense of avoiding it, but we can resent the fact that we have it. We can blame others for the fact that we're suffering. We can we can make it a source of, of cankerous resentment and bitterness. It can It can destroy us. Or we can accept suffering and, 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 in consequence, grow in wisdom and virtue. But I would say that, we, that that's that's something which we all we all are called to do. But there's something deeper that, that the saints at least manage, and that they move beyond the acceptance of suffering to the embrace of suffering. And I would say that Helen Burns is one of these rare individuals uh, that we can canonized if you like um uh that as, as being saints helen burns does not merely accept the suffering in her life uh, and and conveys the wisdom of that acceptance to jane eyre which she takes with her uh throughout her life um but she embraces suffering uh and it's that wisdom ultimately is the deepest element of of what um we are meant to take from from the novel jane eyre but then we find that Jane falls hopelessly in love with Rochester, this charming uh, character, uh, charming and disarming. We might see parallels in, uh, with uh, perhaps Mr. Darcy, this dark, um, um, melancholy, mysterious, morose, and what other alliteration I can get for M's there. Um, so she falls in love with Rochester. We don't know much about him, and we find out more about him as the novel uh, continues. Uh, he is deceptive. Uh, he deceives Jane. He is living uh, essentially a morally decadent lifestyle. And then he makes an immoral proposal to Jane, because when Jane discovers that he is already married, uh, his wife has become insane, the mad woman in the attic that's, that... Um, one of the most haunting figures, if you like, in in modern fiction, uh, the mad woman in the attic in Jane Eyre. Um, but he, he suggests they just elope uh, with each other. Um, and Jane, although she loves him, has enough Christian sensibility and sense to to uh, to to not take him up on that immoral proposal. Instead, before every, anybody gets up, she leaves. Uh, and in leaving, uh, she uh, is condemning herself uh, not just to poverty but to penury, uh, and that's all that she can look forward to. She has not nothing, and she's literally starving to death. When she comes into an inheritance, and uh, this ensures that she uh, is at least going to be materially secure but of course emotionally she is still uh in love with with rochester but is not going to succumb to a any immoral uh, behavior in order to gratify or satisfy that love but they have a reconciliation at the end that that um that there's a conversion that's the important thing that rochester has a conversion 
he sacrificed himself to save people from the fire, uh, including his own wife, although unsuccessfully. Um, and he burns himself uh, and is maimed in consequence. So now he's not the dashing, good-looking, debonair man that he was and assumes that uh, Jane will no longer be interested in him because of this. But Jane, of course, is someone who marry, who loves on a deeper level than that. So he, uh, he has this conversion experience. They have a reconciliation following the conversion experience and then uh, are married. All right, so that's Jane, Jane Eyre. I'll say a few words to finish with um, uh, the novel by the other sister, Anne Bronte, the tenant of Wildfell Hall. And here we see other aspects of perhaps of... Um, of the same what well, we have a recurring motif i would say in all of these three novels and that is the byronic hero and perhaps i should understand i should explain the adjective byronic uh the name byronic comes from lord byron the the dark romantic poet who caused scandal in his own lifetime because of his uh, adulterous love affairs and uh, even suggestion of a, an incestuous relationship uh he causes such scandal that he's forced into exile to the continent and this is this dark brooding byronic figure becomes the uh, the the epitome the 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 archetype of the anti-hero of so much uh, fiction and art and music in the uh, in the 19th century well we see these byronic figures um in in the novels of the brontes uh and especially uh in in the uh tenant of Walfell Hall in the character of Arthur Huntingdon, who's the abusive alcoholic husband to the protagonist of the novel, Helen Huntingdon. Uh, and we see in this sort of uh, alcoholism, and we see you know, hints of it in the, in, in the, in the, the wildness uh, of, uh, of Heathcliff, um, who certainly, you know, Heathcliff's not an, alco not an alcoholic, but he plays upon the alcoholic weakness of other characters. Um, but he certainly has this this, this wild, aggressive violence that all three Bronte sisters experienced in reality in their life with their brother Branwell, who was an alcoholic, although he was a weak, dissolute man, not a Heathcliff, that's for sure. But they lived with uh, alcoholism and with the sins that accompany alcoholism, including uh, the adultery, adulterous relationship that Branwell ha had, for instance, so there's this, you know, we talk about the mad woman in the attic in Jane Eyre, but in some sense, we can see Branwell, the dark sheep of the family, as the mad man in the attic in the lives of these three sisters. And he presents himself in various, manifests himself in various ways, in various novels, as we've said, and not least and probably most obviously in the character of Arthur Huntington. Um, so... Uh, what we see, I think, however, is the the, the 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 all three sisters align themselves morally and philosophically with the Christianity and virtue of their very devout um, um, father, uh, the Reverend Patrick Bronte, uh, who serves his parish for forty years. It's his Christianity that informs the morality of the Bronte sisters' novels. And the, the the darkness we see present might indeed be influenced by the darkness they experienced in real life, such as the, the al al alcoholic, dissolute behavior of their son Branwell, but also from their reading of, of passionate romantic literature, there's something of of the wildness of, 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 of Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster, for instance, in the character of Heathcliff. Ultimately, in, this, in, in the novels of the Brontes, we are shown the sanity of sanctity as the only rational alternative to the insanity of sin. And for that, we should all be very grateful for the novels of the Bronte sisters. Thanks, as always, for joining me in this episode and in all the episodes of The Authority. And until next time, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, 
Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.